nearly all European countries have seen the emergence of a radical or a far right uh, party at some point in time uh, throughout their history. Most of these countries have, have, have seen said parties consolidate. They have seen these parties kind of develop further into a structural political influence or even become sizable political actors. Think about the Bosman in Belgium, Rassemblement National in France, the Lega in Italy, just to name a couple of the more known and successful examples. Few countries have uh, withstood this kind of general, almost European-wide evolution. Uh, Portugal and Spain were the Iberian exceptions uh, in this regard. This, at least until very recently, um, when uh, Chega in Portugal and Vox in Spain entered politics. Um, Vox was already founded in 2013, uh, but only recently became noticed as it obtained 25 seats in the April 2019 election and became the third largest party in the November 2019 election with 52 seats in Spanish parliament. This sudden rise leads to many, many questions that form the subject uh, of this recording. So it is my pleasure to be joined by Lisa Zanotti, a researcher at uh, Diego Portales University in Chile, who just some months ago uh, published a fantastic book uh, on Vox together with Jose Rama, Stuart Turnbull Dugarte and Andres Santana. And it is this book that I want to discuss uh, in a bit more detail today with uh, Lisa. So Lisa, let's uh, start at the beginning. How did Vox uh, come about? Where lie its origins? Give us a bit of background information uh, on the party. Yeah. Um, so Vox, as you mentioned, uh, is not a brand new party. Um, actually Vox, um, uh, we can say that it had failed before um, it succeeded. Um, so we saw that Vox um, um, basically was founded in 2013, as you mentioned, and as a spin-off of the mainstream right party, the APP, the People's Party. Um, and until late 2018, uh, was not uh, relevant from the electoral point of view. Um, the opportunity for Vox uh, to break through uh, was in 2017, um, after the unlawful declaration of independence from the Catalan separatist leader. Um, and at that point, uh, Vox leaders uh, basically saw this change in the opportunity structure and start to discursively um, basically defending the unity of Spain against um, the separatist leaders. Um, and uh, one year later, in uh, December, if I'm not mistaken, 2018, uh, in the Andalusian uh, regional election, uh, Vox uh, obtained more than 10% of the vote and then one year later, six months later, four months later, actually, uh, in April 2018, um, in the first national election uh, of 2018, because we had two, uh, one in April and one in November, uh, they uh, got again the 10% of the, the vote and then uh, November the 15, 15% of the vote. Um, so, uh, it was, it really was this change in opportunity structure uh, that came uh, with the declaration of independence in Catalonia uh, to give them uh, basically the opportunity to uh, make the electoral breakthrough. And what is the specific role of, of this territorial issue uh, for their mobilization and, and for their success? What's the position that they hold and, and, and how does that Go, go to the core of their uh, ideology. So, as I was mentioned before, uh, Catalonia separatist leaders uh, unilaterally decided to um, declare basically independence from Spain uh, following the result of uh, plebiscite uh, unauthorized uh, also. 
um, on basically the Catalan self-determination um, in October of 2017. Um, and Vox, um, leverage basically on popular, popular concerns uh, on um, basically the issue of regional statehood uh, and the ambition of uh, independent statehood of the Catalan government. Um, and built discursively uh, upon uh, an sort of unapologetic Spanish nationalism and relied more and more on uh, national symbols like the flag, the anthem, uh, to present itself as basically the sole uh, political party this, which, which was willing to advocate uh, with sufficient uh, strength uh, for the unity of Spain, basically. Um, and this message on being tough on Catalonia basically played, uh, played out really well for the party and, uh, and basically constructed the core ideological issue uh, for Vox, which is nationalism. Right, and in um, the book, uh, you, you highlight, uh, in addition to Spanish nationalism and the kind of territorial issue, a couple of other, let's say, key ideological components of the party. I was wondering if you could maybe very briefly uh, touch upon them and, and elaborate on them. Uh, yeah, I think that besides nationalism, uh, the other main uh, issue that Vox politicized um, is the, the defense of traditional moral values, uh, such as like, uh, it goes basically against um, the LGBT um, people's rights, and uh, it wants to it wants to limit uh, the abortion rights, and basically against civil minorities. Uh, and this is a very strong issue they put forward. Uh, we saw it too in their party manifesto we analyzed in the book, uh, which is. Um, and, and in both election, we just had one election in the book, but uh, we saw that in the next election, the defense of moral values is still salient. So uh, it looks like it's a really uh, core issue for them. Um, and as other populist radical right parties in Western Europe and in Europe in general, um, they're now play more on anti-immigration sentiments, uh, which is basically the traduction uh, of their nativist ideology, right? And so I'd say that uh, we have nationalism, we have the defense of uh, moral, traditional moral values, and we have anti-immigration uh, sentiments uh, to really sum up uh, their um, ideology. In the book, you also mentioned kind of the, the uh, desire for a more expanded uh, welfare state, as well as some stronger law and order stances. Yeah. Does, does that sure. mean? Does that mean that they're your average or your typical kind of what we call or what uh, Casimir calls then a populist radical right party? Or is there still something that makes it relatively distinct from your prototypical uh, populist radical right party, such as the FPO in Austria or the Front National or Rassemblement National in uh, France? Um, yes, it's both actually. It's a typical, it's somehow a typical populist radical right party because of anti immigration sentiments and because of uh, harder lines of. Um, law and order uh, policies. Um, but uh, as we mentioned earlier, um, the fact that Vox relied that much on nationalist, nationalist sentiments and the defense of the unity of Spain, because 
We cannot forget that Spain historically, uh, the, the party system is structured like in the classic socioeconomic uh, axis and the central periphery axis. So um, the central periphery axis is very, was very salient in, the, in structuring the Spanish uh, party system. So, so yeah, uh, uh, like the defense of nationalism and unity of Spain uh, basically makes it very idiosyncratic to the Spanish situation, uh, but also um, anti-migration sentiments and, um, and reliance on law and order and makes it like fit uh, in the public radical right uh, definition. Um, and the other point we touched a little bit earlier is that um, it strongly relies on the defense of, of traditional values, uh, moral values, which is like not all the populist radical right party in Western Europe uh, do, uh, but some populist radical right party outside Europe uh, do. Uh, we think about uh, Fidesz in Hungary uh, or the discourse of Jerry Bolsonaro in Brazil, for example. All right, so you already touched upon it a little bit, is, is one of the reasons that DOCS became so successful. It has to do with the kind of space that they occupy specifically in the kind of Spanish party system. Um, what are some of the, the kind of distinct factors that really helped make this particular party so successful so quickly in what previously seemed like a very rigid uh, party system? Uh, a Spanish party system starts to somehow be aligned um, before the success of Fox. Uh, and it was uh, basically in uh, 2015 with the emergence of um, Podemos, which is a populist radical left um, party. And uh, Ciudadano, which is basically a, a liberal party. Um, and it kind of crack, cracked open the structure and the, uh, and the dynamic of the competition, uh, which at the national level uh, was basically between two, two parties, um, the Social Democrats, the SOE, and the mainstream right party, the People's Party, the the PP. Um, and then in 2015, basically after the Great Recession and after the measurement, the austerity measurement um, implemented by the PSOE government, uh, the, the party system started to be aligned and we saw the emergence of these two parties. And one of them, the uh, Podemos, uh, was a populist party. Um, but I mean, uh, the characteristic of the economic crisis obviously um, favored the emergence of a populist left party, um, just because um, I mean, the importance of the relevance of material values was basically more important than cultural values, which are politicized by populist radical right party. Right. Um, but I think the emergence of Vox, it's not, I mean, it's more, um, it's basically idiosyncratic to the uh, crisis in Catalonia and to a preoccupation of the people with the fact that in Catalonia, which was not picked up, picked up by the other parties, basically. And uh, it was not anti-immigration sentiments, it was not moral values, it was not uh, law and order, it was nationalism, really gives space uh, for Vox to emerge. And, and also right now, even though anti-immigration sentiments are more important now for them, now for them uh, I think nationalism is their main flag. Um, All right, so is that, is that also something then that we see translated in their in their voters, because obviously, if a party wants to become successful, 
they need to have a sizable amount of people vote for them. And if I'm not mistaken, in the last election, about 3.5 million people or Spanish uh, people voted for this particular uh, party. So what's your typical profile of a, of a Vox voter? Yeah, uh, as for their ideology, um, uh, as well for the voters, I mean, they at some, to some extent are similar to the classic populist radical right voter in, the, in Western Europe, but somehow different. For example, uh, we know that um, populist radical right voters in Western Europe tend to be middle-aged uh, men, and um, but in the case of Fox, we saw that uh, compared to the other parties in Spanish and to other parties outside, of, uh, to other populist radical right parties outside of Spanish, um, they tend to be younger, for example. Uh, they tend to be under age of 44. Um, and uh, if, you look, if we look at the youngest cohort of voters, uh, there is almost a 10% uh, point gap between, uh, the, between Vox voters and the PP voter, for example, which is the main uh, radical, uh, the main mainstream right. Um, and the other main difference uh, between Vox and uh, between Vox voters and the other populist radical right voters in Europe is um, the, um, the income. Uh, they tend to be uh, the party of the wealth in Spain. Um, so I think um, Vox voters is pretty similar to the voters of other populist radical right party, but age and income uh, really make a uh, difference in their voter profile. Uh, what about their their kind of general behavior or their their ideology? Do they closely match what you described earlier about the party? Then being more um, nationalist, anti-immigration, etc. Yeah, they are they are more nationalist. They tend to um, like prefer, they, they like to identify more with Spain, with Spain as a unity uh, than with uh, their um, regional, let's say, um, identity, identification. And um, they tend to have uh, anti-immigration stance, uh, very strong, even in, in comparison with other populist radical right parties outside of Europe, outside of, uh, I'm sorry, outside of Spain. And, um, and they have somehow uh, sentiments toward, um, um, they have sentiments in opposition to the EU integration. Uh, they tend to support uh, the Spexit, Spanish exit from the EU. Um, so yeah, uh, anti-EU, anti-immigration, and, um, and wealthy and young. Okay, so I mean, in, in terms of their let's say social demographic uh, characteristics in terms of their behavioral characteristics that reflects some similarities, some differences with um, mainstream and other European uh, uh, populist radical right parties. But specifically, uh, I wanna maybe finally touch upon how these voters feel about uh, democracy. Recent research shows that these populist supporters on either side of the political spectrum, really, they tend to align themselves with democratic values, but are quite unhappy with how democracy is really being implemented. So making them kind of quote unquote, dissatisfied Democrats. Is that something that we also see amongst Vox voters or uh, do they stand out here in this regard? They do stand out. Um and in a pretty worrisome 
uh, way um, we, to analyze uh, both the support for democracy and the satisfaction with democracy of Fox voters. Uh, we used a typology that combines the two, uh, support and satisfaction. And we saw that first in Spain, like among Spani um, parties in Spanish party system, uh, the ones uh, we called um, unsatisfied authoritarians, uh, which had like low support for democracy and low satisfaction with democracy together, um, where, I mean, they're much more um, present in uh, Vox voters that uh, in the other parties in Spain. And then we compare them uh, for other populist radical right parties in Europe. And we saw the same. I think the only exception was um, AFD in Germany, which has pretty much, pretty much the same amount of unsatisfied um, authoritarians. Um, and then uh, we saw, um, we analyzed the, uh, the level of regime support uh, as a determinant uh, for vote choice for Vox uh, towards, I mean, in comparison with other parties in Spain. And we saw that those uh, who uh, are less supportive of democracy as a political regime um, are more likely to vote for us, which is a um, sort of odd finding um, because, uh, as you mentioned, literature on um, regime support and the vote for populist radical right party doesn't basically uh, find any um, relationship between uh, the two of them. So this negative effect, this positive effect uh, between low support uh, for democracy and vote for Vox is, is odd and, and worrisome. So uh, if, if I can then finish up by asking you to speculate a little bit, what might be the cause of this? Like, how could we explain this kind of worrisome picture that you're painting, or at least regarding this particular aspect of the, the box voter? Um, it, it's a speculation, but uh, we, in analyzing box uh, discourse, we observe that uh, they make reference uh, a lot uh, to who basically discursive elements who were present that were present in the discourse of uh, the the uh, the dictator basically the leaders of the dictatorship of Francisco Franco um, they <clears throat> talk about they make reference to the living Spain España Viva uh, in opposition of the end. It is Spain, um, La Anti Espana, uh, and these references are both in the electoral manifesto and in the public speeches of the leaders. And in this sense, as I mentioned before, it's essential to note that this opposition, the real Spain and the anti Spain, um, <clears throat> became really frequent in the occasion of general election of uh, 1936. Uh, at like it was a clear a clear indication of the political division of the country uh, which was a prelude of the civil war um, and uh, also the manifesto of the November 20 uh, 19 election is called uh, 100 uh, 100 medidas para la España viva uh, like 100 measures of, for the living Spain. Living Spain. So uh, they have the discursive elements, but then also uh, the two more idiosyncratic uh, issues uh, they put out discursively, uh, which was nationally, which is nationalism and uh, the defense of traditional moral values, 
are two issues that uh, the dictatorship uh, also put out uh, discursively um, during those years. So um, actually Sp Spain was uh, a really, really, really conservative country and he started to liberalize <clears throat> much after the return to democracy. So this are somehow discursively picking up on traditional moral values and nationalism, um, which they was always present in the in the Spain in Spain society, um, even after the return to democracy. Uh, so they were successful basically in politicizing these two issues and to discursively present uh, their um, views in a way that is um, basically linked to the way uh, in which the dictatorship did. Um, so it's, it's a speculation, um, but uh, I think it has to do with, uh, with this. All right, I think, I mean, this provides us with much uh, food for thought. Uh, thank you very much for painting this both very comparatively similar picture to other parties across Europe, as well as a very in idiosyncratic picture of uh, Vox. I guess the main question that now remains is whether the party is actually able to consolidate this kind of initial support and, and kind of whether it will be able to definitely put to bed this notion of Iberian or at least Spanish exceptionalism. Thank you so much for uh, talking to me about this wonderful book that I can certainly recommend to, to everybody. Thank you, Lisa. Oh, thank you for having me again. And I hope it was interesting and it's going to be useful. <laughs> <laughs>